Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. In Mexico, the presidential elections are a matter of tremendous controversy. Tens of thousands of people have been in the streets saying the elections were stolen. Now joining us to talk about what's happening is James Cocroft. He is an award-winning author, a bilingual poet, a lecturer on policy issues of the day, as well as a three-time Fulbright scholar. He's written more than 50 books, including Mexico's Revolution, Then and Now, and he joins us today from Montreal. Thanks very much for joining us, James. Thanks for having me, Paul. So first of all, give us the basic facts of what happened in the election and, and what, what is the controversy? What, why, why is it being so challenged? The uh, election has been challenged for many months now because the mass media in Mexico, led by Televisa, the big TV uh, monopoly, or part of a duopoly, actually, uh, was coming out in favor constantly for one candidate, the candidate who supposedly triumphed in the July 1 presidential election, Peña Nieto. And it was uh, broadcasting false uh, news about his uh, main contender from the left center, Lopez Obrador, and uh, telling lies about Lopez Obrador and half-truths about uh, the uh, candidate that uh, it supported, Peña Nieto, from the PRI, the uh, former uh, longest ruling political party in the world until its replacement in a fairly democratic election in the year 2000 by a more conservative party. And that conservative party has been in power for the last 12 years and uh, has uh, continued to guide Mexico down to the abyss of economic failure and poverty and more violence, etc. Uh, with the so-called narco war. So that propaganda for the candidate of the PRI in a, an arrangement where the two conservative parties, the PRI and the PAN, were to change the presidency every now and then, uh, because it was clear that governing party couldn't win after all the deaths, 60,000 people killed in a phony narco war in the last six years, uh, it caused a lot of people to be upset. And then the student movement erupted on the eve of the election. And the student movement, which quickly allied with our own student movement here in Quebec, where I live in Montreal, and the big student movement in Chile, where also there's a long-standing strike going on, uh, the student movement literally came out on the streets to protest against this TV channel, uh, Televisa, and its candidate, Peña Nieto, saying that it was basically misreporting the news and uh, leading people to vote for Peña Nieto because they didn't know what Lopez Obrador really stood for. And part of, part of the they, challenge, they, if, excuse, excuse me, go part, ahead. part of the challenge, if I understand correctly, from Lopez Obrador is that this indirectly violated campaign financing laws. It, it amounted to you know millions of dollars of free advertising. Exactly. And in addition... Lopez Obrador's campaign has documented that independently of the TV coverage, Peña Nieto has spent between 10 and 13 times more than the legal limit established by law on his campaign. The legal limit is $26 million, and 10 or 13 times that is hundreds of millions of dollars. In addition, the charge by Lopez Obrador against this uh, fraudulent election of Peña Nieto, this rigged election, if you will, is that five million votes were bought directly with that extra money that was sloshing around in the campaign. And uh, bribing poor people in the rural areas and better off people in the suburbs, uh, particularly the home state of Peña Nieto, Mexico state, where he had been governor and had overseen a very violent regime that repressed workers and peasants. Apparently it bought about uh, a million votes just in his home state alone, where he won as a result, and uh, five million votes total when right. his, uh, nationally, when his margin of alleged victory was three million. So the, uh, the difference in votes is something like about the number of votes that they uh, accuse have been bought, is that right? Yeah, well, actually, even uh, uh, they only won by three million votes, but they're uh, accused of having purchased five million votes. Right. Okay. And uh, then there's some other hanky panky that Lopez Obrador is also bringing to light. 
But, you know, for most Mexicans, uh, this is sort of a standard operational procedure. Their elections have been fraudulent for years now. That's why they threw out the PRI in 2000. They had a mass movement in the streets for democracy, for real democracy as opposed to fraudulent democracy. And that movement was succeeding when they elected a president in 1988 whose election was taken away by Salinas. And uh, Salinas came into power at that point, consolidated all the alliances with the narco gangs, consolidated the alliances with the U.S. economic interests and oil interests in Mexico, and has, uh, Salinas himself was caught, by the way, uh, in a series of uh, illegalities, not only in the 88 election, but as president over the next six years. He had to flee, uh, he had to flee justice. Right. And go go so, live in England for a while. He's back in Mexico now, apparently pulling a lot of the strings behind the scenes right. for this, James, this campaign. James, the, the, the I mean, underlying struggle here is that, and I guess my question is, will the Mexican elite, which has done so well with this neoliberal economics and free trade and you know some of the, some of the richest billionaires in the world have, have emerged in Mexico, uh, are, are they going to allow any legal process that would bring in Lopez Obrador, who at least in terms yeah. of his campaign promises, uh, is a, you know, wants an alternative to this kind of neoliberal economics? Yeah, uh, he, he's running against uh, neoliberal economics, and it's not even uh, a socialist program or anything of the kind. It's just a sort of moderate uh, capitalism, that, a more humane capitalism <laughs> that, that he's advocating. And, of course, protection of the nation's national resources, particularly oil, most of which has already been delivered indirectly to the U.S. and other foreign companies. So he's sort of a nationalist, moderate centrist, left of center. But the elites, as you say, will not allow him in. And so that's why in the previous presidential election that he ran in six years ago, Lopez Obrador won by everyone's testimony and it's been documented, including in my new book, Mexico's Revolution Then and Now. And uh, yet he was not allowed to take office. Calderon came in from the conservative PAN party and unleashed the military on the people to repress any social movements of protest. Now, back in 2006, of course, in the name of fighting narco gangs, but it's really to repress the social movements. Back in 2006, uh, during that stealing of the election, uh, the Mexicans occupied the uh, main streets of Mexico City, Paseo de la Reforma, right down to the Zocalo, the main plaza, for three months, occupied the streets and camped out and protested this uh, fraud. And now uh, they're not doing that this year. Lopez Obrador said, don't tie up traffic, don't do that. Uh, we're gonna go through the courts and so on. That's what he's doing now. Right. But the people are ignoring him and going out in the streets anyway. <laughs> and led in great part by this student movement that formed alliances with those very worker and peasant movements that Peña Nieto repressed four years ago in the state of Mexico when the president-elect so-called Peña Nieto was governor at that time. So it's formed alliances with uh, okay. working class people and with uh, gay and uh, uh, lesbian people and uh, with oppressed peoples in general, any, any peoples with complaints. Uh, elaborate a little bit more why you're calling this a uh, phony narco war. Well, it turns out, according to the UN Commission Against Drugs and Crime, that the vast majority of money in the narco traffic is laundered by the six largest U.S. banks. And the amount of money they laundered in 2008, when so many of the major banks collapsed, was enough to bail them out. But the narco trafficking is fundamental not only to the banks and therefore the survival of the U.S. economy, but to U.S. foreign policy, which uses the phony wars against narco trafficking to destabilize countries and justify the creation of military bases in those countries, okay, as back, it did in Colombia in the last 30 years, and is beginning to do in Mexico, particularly in the last six right. years. That, Don't right. forget, uh, narco-trafficking is the second biggest liquid capital flow going on in world trade and world economics. Right. Now, the, the is Obrador considered a serious threat to all of this, including Lopez the, nar Obrador the narco trafficking? Lopez Obrador is considered a Lopez serious Obrador. threat in Washington. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even though he's guaranteed foreign investments and reassured foreign capital, he is considered a serious threat. So, so what happens so if, if the uh, election officials in Mexico and the Supreme Court and all the various process eventually 
validate this election. And millions of people think it was rigged. And the student movement has come alive. And as you described, has allied itself with workers and peasants and such. How, how, do, how does this movement respond to such a decision? I can assure your listeners, Paul, that these movements will continue and they will grow. And they will grow rapidly. So stay tuned. You're going to hear more from Mexico's masses. All right, thanks very much for joining us, James. Thank you for having me, Paul. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.